Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not us who disdain. Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on thee our souls depend. In compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with thy rich grace. Tune our lips to sing thy praise. Tune our lips to sing thy praise. In thine own appointed way, now we seek thee, here we stay. Lord, we know not how to go, till a blessing thou bestow, till a blessing thou bestow. Grant that all may seek and find Thee, a God so supremely kind. Heal the sick, the captive free. Let us all rejoice in Thee. Let us all rejoice in Thee. Please be seated. louder oh there we go that sounds John sorry sorry about that buddy uh, welcome we're glad that you guys are here uh, wanted to say uh, good morning and go ahead and turn to somebody near you and say I'm glad you're here I'm glad you're here Judy you're the person I picked glad that you guys are all here it's great to gather to worship the Lord. We're going to do that. Uh, Bill's going to lead us in some worship songs. We're going to sing some old songs and some newer songs just to, to lift up the name of our Lord and to talk about his faithfulness. I'm going to preach a little bit later a lesson from the beginning of Exodus as we begin to study through the book of the Old, Test the Old Testament book of Exodus. If you got one of these bulletins and the order of worships on your way in, then you actually have a lot of information. This tells you where we're going this morning. And on the back, this tells you where you can go uh, later on this week. There are some midweek gatherings and some more opportunities for you to be in community with other Christians, to open up God's word and to be enriched by it. And like we said this morning, to ask ourselves that question, who is God? What can we do to honor him? What does it look like to live faithful lives as Christians? And these are some great opportunities to do that. So talk to me if you have more questions about that. As always, every week we will observe and uh, the Lord's Supper. Remember Jesus at the communion table. So make sure that you have one of these two options. There's uh, the old version and the new version of these communion cups. With the, those are available in the lobby if you didn't get one. I think Matt McLean's going there right now. So just flag down Matt and say, hey, get me one too. Um, I usually forget something during this time, but we're, we're just going to worship together this morning. We're going to pray for one another. Uh, and We're just going to Say, Lord, here we are. We are your children. Use us for whatever your purposes are. Let's worship together. After this song, Sarah Gibson has a scripture reading for us. Show me. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. 
Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. Where there is hatred, we will sow his love. Where there is injury, we will never judge. Where there is striving, we will speak his peace. To the people crying for release, we will be his instruments of peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. Where there is blindness, we will pray for sight. Where there is darkness, we will shine his light. Where there is sadness, we will bear their grief. To the millions crying for release, we will be his instruments of peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. Brothers and sisters, be the salt you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were noble of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. After this song, Ryan Gibson will lead us in prayer. How, so, how sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the word. When each can feel his brother's sigh and with him bear a part. When sorrow flows from eye to eye and joy from heart to heart. When free from envy, scorn, and pride, our wishes all above. Each can his brother's failings hide and show a brother's love. When love in one delightful stream through every bosom flows, when union sweet and dear esteem in every action glows, 
Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above. And he's an heir of heaven who finds his bosom glow with love. Lord, thank you for this day that you have made. Thank you for bringing us all here together. And I pray that you can open our hearts and our minds to receive the message that we have today, the message that Jacob brings to us, the messages we get through these songs and worshiping you. You know what it is that we need more than we do. And I just pray that you can let us be receptive to hear as you speak to us in whatever way you choose. In Jesus' name, amen. Show me blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. After this song, we'll take of the Lord's Supper. For this song, we will sing the four verses and then conclude with the refrain. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior, so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he's to blame. Upon his precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the King. They struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. When they nailed him to the cross, his mother stood nearby. He said, woman, behold thy son. He cried at thirst for water, but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished, 
He gave himself to die, salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Invite John Rogers to come and join me at the table. Uh, this last fall, you might remember, we had a series of time around the table, remembering Jesus. And we asked several Tri Valley members to recount how they became followers of Jesus. We remembered him through saying, Hey, I'm going to ask you two questions. One, who is it who first told you about Jesus? How did Jesus become part of your life? That's true for all of us. At some point, we learned about Jesus. It could have been from the people who raised us, people who shared Christ with us for the first time. It could be just the environment we were raised in. But everybody has an answer to that question. Who is one of the first people to tell you about Jesus? And the second question we asked everybody was, what was it about Jesus that made you want to follow him? Part B to the same question is, why do you still follow him to this day? What do you love about Jesus? Uh, John wants to share his responses to those questions with us this morning. So I'm very excited for him to share. I'm just going to do like we've done in the past. And say, let's remember Jesus together by uh, remembering how Jesus came into John's life. John, who first told you about Jesus? Well, uh, I have to start from the beginning. Oh, and, Go for it. And just, uh, I'll just kind of give you a brief history of my Christendom, <laughs> so to speak. Um, okay. I get some feedback, though, this way. Joseph will handle that. Okay. Um, in 1939, I had first been baptized, and I was only like three years old. And I didn't really remember that. But I was raised in a, a traditional uh, Catholic family, a very good family. Uh, they never went to church, but uh, they sent me and my sister all the time. In fact, uh, I went through uh, uh, Holy Communion, I went through Confirmation, and I did everything I was supposed to do. But I really didn't understand it. I just went and went through the motions. And uh, whenever the, the priest would say things, I didn't understand because he was speaking in a tongue that I didn't understand, it, but it's Latin. So it wasn't uh, some strange tongue. It's just one that I didn't understand. Anyway, I did go. And then uh, once, one day it happened that uh, I had some uh, construction going on in my neighborhood. And I looked down, and there was a guy, uh, his name was Wayne Williams. And anyway, he was digging a ditch. And I asked, what's going on? He said, well, we're going to build a house here. Oh, so anyway, I got to be friends with him. I didn't know that he had several good-looking sisters at the time. But anyway, uh, they lived at 841, and I lived at 825 Green Lake Drive. And uh, they invited me to go to services one day. And so I went. And uh, I have a couple of books here. One that maybe some of you recognize. This was a book that was given to me on February the 4th in 1953. And that was the day that I was baptized into Christ. 
I can't say that I remembered everything about it, but I do remember that I didn't have to confess my faults in front of everybody. In fact, I think we talked about that one time before. I thought confession meant that I was going to have to confess every sin that I ever had done. And I have a lot of them. So uh, I was so thankful when Joe Gilmore, who was the minister at the time, asked me, he says, uh, I want to uh, have you con make a good confession. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? I said, yes, I do. And I was really relieved that that was a confession. <laughs> and I was happy, very happy. But then, you know, like a lot of other people, I, uh, I kind of fell away from that. I, I went into the Navy, and I don't need to say too much more about that, but I kind of drifted away for a while. But when I came back, I uh, decided not to go to East Oakland Congregation anymore because of uh, some of my past friends. And uh, anyway, uh, the people that influenced me were the Williams family, and that was uh, Doris Levon Williams and Joy Fay Williams. And uh, of course, you, Joel and Joy aren't here today, but they, they certainly were an inspiration in my life. And Deanne Dalton, or I should say Deanne Wolfer now, uh, was also an inspiration in my life. Because of the life that they lived, I thought, you know, they did have something. And when I first went to the First Church of Christ, I got to tell you, I, I had this book, and they gave me this book when I was baptized, and, and it's a good book. But one of the things was that I found, and I have to make a confession, I felt that they were too dogmatic about a lot of the things that were being taught. And in fact, I quit going to East Austin, I went to San Leandro, and I met, the, I met Don and Judy Pemberton over there too. They probably don't remember me, but I was in my Navy uniform at the time, and anyway, uh, they were gracious people. So I've known people in the Church of Christ for a long, long time. But I started looking at their lives, and I, I can't help but say that uh, Levon and Joy and Deanne were great inspirations in my life. But the biggest inspiration was Dennis Williams. He used to pack up her car every Sunday. I'd go down to the Catholic Church right away because I didn't want to, and then I'd come back, and I'd go ride with him. But she, put all those girls and, and kids in the car and she went everything, they never missed, they never missed a service. And I never heard her yell at her kids. She always had kind words to say. She was a kind lady. In fact, she reminded me a lot of, uh, uh, oh, I can't hear her name, Madeline Jones. In fact, uh, Venice used to say, if I should only be like Madeline Jones, and Madeline Dunn said, if I could only be like Dennis Williams. <laughs> so, I, I mean, they were really great inspirations of my life. And uh, so, anyway, because of that, and when I first went to the Church of Christ today, it reminded me a lot of it. We had one song leader that led the singing. We didn't have any, we didn't have any statues and stuff around, though, like, they did where the other place there was a stained glass window and just really, so it was quite a change. But the biggest change in my life is when I moved out here to Livermore. And uh, the people at East Oakland would say, why are you going way out there for? So, oh, I forgot one very important fact. I met my wife at East Oakland. <laughs> and I was going at San Leandro at the time, but a friend of mine, uh, uh, and I went, uh, we went, it's called church hopping, so we went and we went over and we hopped over to East Oakland and there were these two nice welcome young ladies and uh, anyway, Ira Duvall, 
maybe I know that the Templeton remember them, but Ira Duval and myself, we saw a girl named Joanna Keeks, which you probably remember that name, well, Don, my friend, they, they married, but anyways, <laughs> he went with, uh, he went with Joanne and I went with Rhonda to have coach. And so we had coach. And then the next day, I had to go to work. And I worked in, uh, in Richmond at the time. <laughs> I'll tell you, I had to really hurry because she was going to be babysitting with her cousins over in the same area and was about two miles away. And so I rushed out of there one day and got over there and my first meal was chicken noodle soup. And that's still my very favorite today. Anyway, I know I said a lot of things there, but I'm just telling you, he should have called 10,000 angels. He did everything for us. He sacrificed for us. And I don't think that we really understand the love that he had for us. I know uh, I didn't, and, and to this day, it's hard for me to understand how much he does love us. I know when I was married to my wife, I knew she loved me. But you know, after she passed away, and I had found little things that I've seen her, little cards that I wrote, little things, I didn't know how much she did love me. And I equate that with the same thing with my Savior. I do not know how much God really loves us. And I think that when we do, realize that and we pay attention to what he did for us that maybe we'll have peace in our lives because that's what he gives us and today we're going to partake of the communion service which was representative of the last supper that he had and so uh i have one of those are you getting your own i got my own i get two then <laughs> Everybody gets an individual communion cup. So anyway, that's what I have to say. And uh, would you wear a prayer for this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's pray together. God, we are thankful during this time of remembrance. We remember Jesus, his life with his disciples, his teachings, his wisdom, his great love for us, his willingness to go to the cross. And we also remember Jesus, who was raised, who was, didn't stay dead, who was resurrected and stayed alive in our lives. And in the lives of John, we remember the people who pointed us to Jesus. We give you praise and thanks for the ways that you're always working in our lives and in the lives of people around us to draw us closer to you. And as we take this bread, the body of Christ, and as we drink this juice, the blood of Christ, we remember his great love. And we ask that you will give us a better understanding of the greatness of that love. Like John said, we think we know, but we really don't know. And it's such an adventure to discover more and more each day, each time we gather around this table, the great love that you have shown us in your son Jesus Christ. We pray this prayer in his name. Amen. Let's take the bread and the juice together. Well, I appreciate you sharing it, John. Thanks for yeah. yeah. Let's uh let's show our appreciation to John for sharing his story. Um, I don't know if we have the, the, the garbage can patrol coming by to pick up the, the things today, but usually somebody comes by. You can just set this aside and we can pick them up later if you don't see the, the trash can crew. But we want to transition from the table into a time of teaching. We're going to invite the young people, ages 4 through 5th grade, to head over to Kids Worship in the Family Life Center where they will have a lesson about Jesus They'll remember him over there, and thank you to Brittany, who's teaching this morning. Thank you, Brittany. Everybody say hi to Brittany. 
All right, there she goes. Um, and if you have a child that is under the age of four, we have a nursery back in the back where they will have Bible lessons and songs and playtime. It's fantastic. And the rest of us, you're, you guys are right where you should be. We are going to continue on, slash begin our study through the book of Exodus. Thank you, Evie. She left it up there. Uh, everybody good? You ready to go? Ready for Exodus? I got some more over here. Cool. Uh, let me show you a picture of me back in the day. Go ahead and put this up there, tech person. That's several people, um, but I am one of them, the good-looking guy in the corner. That's my brother, Dan. I'm the other one in the far corner goofing off. I think I was probably like 17 at the time. This is uh, taken on a family trip to Cannon Beach, Oregon. Give me a little head nod if you've ever been to Cannon Beach or the Oregon coast. It's gorgeous. For some reason, my family would always go there in March. Had to do with some kind of some relative's birthday. And it's like, man, the Northwest is kind of cold and rainy all the time. The best time to go to the beaches is in the summer. Why would we go when it was always cold? It was always windy. It was always rainy. Uh, I guess tradition Trump, but uh, there's me and there's my family standing in front of the iconic Haystack Rock. If you've been to Cannon Beach, you remember Haystack Rock. It is huge. But this doesn't have a whole lot to do with our lesson. <laughs> I just kind of wanted to take a little trip down memory lane. It's more meaningful for me than it is for you, but uh, I was reminded of memory lane as I looked at the beginning of Exodus, because Exodus kind of starts with its own trip down memory lane. It refers back to things that happened before the beginning of the scroll of Exodus, and it makes sense for us to look back and say, oh, let's look back at what happened so we can better understand how we got to where we are. Kind of like I do when I look at this picture. You can take it away, Molly. It's not that important. Exodus begins with a trip down memory lane, reminding us of uh, the story of Genesis. Genesis, you get all kinds of great uh, origin stories from the Bible. Patriarchs, you get how God developed a covenant with Abraham and then his son Isaac. And then this guy named Jacob, good name, had a ton of sons. And one of his sons' name was Joseph. Joseph, this is kind of where Genesis ends and what transitions us into the story of the Exodus. Joseph had a series of ups and downs in his life and in his faith. It's this great example of man thinks can be going great and then they, the bottom can drop out. But then there's... there's Redemption. There's, there's a new chance. There's a new opportunity. Ups and downs. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe that's how it feels like in life. Maybe that's how it feels as we're trying to follow Jesus and be faithful. Some days we're getting it and it's going great. And some days, ah, I don't know how I got here. I don't know how I'm going to get to a new place. Genesis ends with the story of Joseph's life. He was the favorite son of his father, Jacob, so that's pretty good. But then made his brothers jealous, so they sell him into slavery. That's not so good. Uh, but then he finds himself in the service of a wealthy man, and he has all these privileges in his house, and things are going good again. But then he's falsely accused and thrown into prison. Drag. So he's at this low point again. But if you remember the story, he's able to interpret the, the ruler of Egypt's dreams and, and make sense of things. They said, bring him into my house. I'm going to give him responsibilities. And he rises to become one of the most trusted advisors of the king of Egypt. That's where the story ends. And he calls for his brothers who sent him into slavery. And you expect he's going to do this big, ha ha, I told you so. Now it's time for my revenge. But he says, no, 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 I'm not worried about that. I just want you guys to come and be where I am. I want there to be, there's a famine in the land. And he's like, I just want to save God's people from famine. And through all these ups and downs, the question is asked in Genesis, where is God? What was God doing? And I think Joseph has a very helpful answer to this question. He's got a healthy perspective on the ups and downs of his life and faith. And there's this famous line that Joseph gives when he's speaking to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, that I think is going to be a helpful refrain for us this morning. He tells them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph acknowledges that God was at work throughout the events of his life. Even when people around him were doing evil, 
even when the forces around him were trying to thwart the good works that God wanted to accomplish, God was still there, God was still active, and God was for God's people. That's how Genesis ends. And then we're told, in the 400 years between that story and the beginning of Exodus, the Israelites go from being in Egypt, where Joseph had this power to, uh, they just increase in number. They're, they're becoming more and more numerous, and all this time passes, and the new king, who doesn't remember Joseph or his family or have a particular affinity toward the Israelite people, says, there are too many of these guys. We have to do something about it. So that background, with that trip down memory lane, we're sort of up to speed, and we can hear what happens with God's people in Egypt. Let's read a big section together from Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Now Joseph and all of his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful, and they multiplied greatly, increased in number, became so numerous that the land was filled with them. And then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if a war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Rameses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor. In brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous, and they give birth before the midwives can arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Interesting. A lot going on here. Just so you know, this morning, this is one of three big sections that we're going to listen to. Here, we hear the language that the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied. That's a trip down memory lane itself. If you go even farther back in Genesis, you hear that language where? In the creation story, remember? God says, here's my creation. Here's the crown jewel of my creation. People, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, fill the land. So the Israelites were doing what God commanded them to do. But they were not rewarded for it. They were doing what was right, and the Pharaoh said, well, but what about what I want to have happen? Ah, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do some population control here. He tries to undo God's desire for them to increase in number, not just by enslaving them, but by actually killing them off. We see him say, if you see a baby boy, just kill it. Pretty terrible stuff. And when the midwives outsmart him, he says, all right, well, I'm not just going to tell the midwives, kind of keep this on the sly. We're just going to make an announcement. If you see a baby boy that's an Israelite, Throw it in the Nile. we got to get rid of these people. Awful stuff, right? But this is a good point to remind ourselves about this concept we talked about a few weeks ago of the world. Remember this evil force? Remember the evil forces, the, the, the devil and the flesh and the world? Let's remind ourselves of the definition of what we said the world is, because I think it fits with what's happening in this story. The world is a system of ideas, values, morals, practices, and social norms that are integrated into the mainstream and eventually institutionalized in a culture corrupted by the twin sins of rebellion against God and the definition of good and evil. In other words, when doing what is wrong becomes what is right. 
according to the powers that be. We see the world at work in this story. Pharaoh redefines what is right and what is good. It's not God saying, it's good for my people to be fruitful and multiply. Life is good. Take care of those babies. Pharaoh says, no, no, no. Here's a new definition of what's good. When I'm in control. When they don't outnumber us. And so we're going to say that killing them is what's right. It's a complete reversal of what is right. But when the person in power says, you got to do it, what do you do? That was the dilemma facing the midwives here. And it's not much different from the dilemma that's facing people of faith nowadays. I'm reminded of some modern parallels. There are medical professionals and teachers who are in instructed to do things that go against their beliefs or their best judgment. But they say, no, 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 there are reasons you just need to do this. I have a friend named Nate who worked in the financial industry. He worked for Morgan Stanley for years and he said, the things that my boss was telling me to do, I just couldn't do. I wish I had more details, but I don't remember exactly what he said. It has to do with selling junk bonds to taking advantage of people. He's like, this is how we make money. This is just what you're going to have to do. You're going to fall in line. And he said, I won't do that, but I still want this job. So I'll do this instead. And he said he came up with an alternative. He's like, I'm not going to do the thing you, you say you need me to do because I don't agree with it, but I'm going to work in this area as an alternative. And he was able to keep his job. And he told me he had to work triple the amount of hours that he would have had to work over here. It was a sacrifice for him to just be able to do the right thing and remain in this position. And maybe that's something that we can relate to. I think that's something that these Hebrew midwives can relate to. They had to come up with a creative solution. Their solution's kind of funny, actually. They're like, Hebrew women? Oh man, they give birth real fast. We can't get there in time. Like, <laughs> we would kill these babies, but uh, I mean, they're just too vigorous for us. Kind of, kind of funny if it weren't so tragic and sad. But they did what was faithful to God and not what was commanded to them by the person in power. And once again, we can hear an echo of Joseph's evaluation of what was going on. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Pharaoh's plan was use the midwives to kill off the Israelites. But God used the plan. He used the midwives for good. Maybe it's a reminder for us that a little bit of faithfulness goes a long way. This story also reminds us that the names of the faithful are remembered, but those of the wicked are often just forgotten. They pass away. We don't know the name of this king of Egypt from this story, but we remember Shifra and we remember Pua. Kind of reminds me of John's story at the table names of the faithful men and women who had an influence on his life. A little bit of kindness, a little bit of faithfulness goes a long way. And it reminds us too that sometimes there's a risk for doing what is right. And sometimes you do the right thing and you're not rewarded for it. The Israelites, we did, we, we were fruitful and we increased. And what do we get for it? But we're reminded that God is always at work. So the story continues. The king's plan doesn't work. He ups the ante by saying, just throw all the baby boys into the Nile. Tell everybody to do that. This is the new standard practice. But then comes part of the story about a specific baby boy who was a Hebrew who actually was thrown into the Nile and how God was able to use him. Now we meet Moses. Exodus chapter 2. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch, and then she placed the child in it, put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And then his sister asked Pharaoh, or asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, he answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. 
Nice. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Just pause right there and, and point out a couple things. There's actually a lot of irony in this part of the story. You might notice that the river, which was intended to be an instrument of death for Moses, ends up being the very thing that saved his life. You also notice that Moses' mother throws him in the river, which is exactly what Pharaoh said to do. If you have a Hebrew baby, you know, get that baby in the river. But it doesn't have Pharaoh's desired effect. And what ends up happening instead is that baby Pharaoh was trying to get rid of is raised in his own house. He's tried to get him over here, but he's closer than anyone else. Oh, so sweet. I love these details. And then you got Moses' mother. She's like, oh, my baby, i got to save my baby. She puts him in the basket, and the sister's watching, and then they're like, we need someone to nurse this baby. Can we find someone to nurse this baby? She's like, I know somebody. How about his mom? I don't know it's his mom, but isn't that great? Anybody who's ever had a 3 a.m nursing session with a baby, how would you love it if they're like, yeah, yeah, we need you to nurse this baby, and we'll pay you $10,000. You're like, okay, I don't, I'm 3 a.m. not so bad. That's a pretty sweet deal. That's kind of what ends up happening here. We're seeing God at work, even in the midst of the evil of the world. We saw in the previous snapshot the midwives. God was using them, his faithful people who were Hebrews, to accomplish his purposes. But in this segment, we see that God uses people outside of the children of Israel. He's using Pharaoh's daughter to accomplish his purposes. She was not one of the chosen. She was not an Israelite. She was Egyptian. She probably worshipped Egyptian gods and doesn't even know the name of Yahweh. But she has compassion because we believe God created everybody. Everybody bears the image of their creator. She has the compassion of God. I don't know who wouldn't in this situation, but her heart goes out. She rescues this baby. God uses her. Remember this God that we met last week that's described throughout Exodus and throughout the Bible, the Lord who is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love. God's compassion is reflected in Pharaoh's daughter. As I think about us, I think about the people that we encounter. We think not everybody knows Jesus. Not everybody worships God or even believes in God. But we can see the spark of God in people. We can see the, the compassion of God in the actions of our neighbors. People who maybe are not as far away from God as we assume. And I've said in the past, it's good for us to acknowledge and encourage Christ-likeness when we see it in other people. Remember, that was one of our homework assignments in our class this fall and in the sermon series. It's just think of somebody who is forgiving the way that Christ was, who is sacrificial, who is others-focused, who, who just exudes the joy of Christ. We acknowledge that and say, hey, you know what? You're a lot like Jesus. Jesus is who I'm trying to follow. So <laughs> to paraphrase one of the gospel stories, you're not far from the kingdom. I think that can be an encouragement for somebody. That could pique their interest and say, I'm like, I'm like Jesus, how? In this way, just this, the way that you are with your coworkers, the way that you are with your family. The impact, I mean, the testimony that John gave about these people, that when he was a young Christian, they weren't teaching him, they weren't preaching at him, but they were modeling the life of Christ for him. If you affirm that in somebody else, maybe they'll lean in and say, I want to know more about this Jesus that apparently I'm like. You're telling them about the God in whose image they are created. Take a little pause right now, and I want you to do something. I want you to think of one person in your life that comes to mind when I say, who among the people you know who are not believers actually have some characteristics of Jesus? And I want you to do what Joyce is doing right now. Take a piece of paper and a pencil, pen, pencil, or take out your phone. Make yourself a reminder to include that person. Or to affirm the Christ-likeness of that person. Maybe you do that now. Send them a text and say, the way that you love your kids reminds me of Jesus. Your patience reminds me of the God that we worship and serve. Do that now. And if you're just waiting for me to say more stuff, it's not going to happen until you do what I'm asking you to do. Make yourself a note. Send that person a message. I'm going to be quiet for a minute or two while you guys do that.
Just think of one person who's like Jesus that you can affirm and then do that. All right, Molly. Last section of the story we're going to look at today. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. And he asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up, came to their rescue, and watered their flock. And when the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. Where is he? Ruel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man, who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. That was quick. Maybe some time has passed. So, four. Mo- uh, Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. And during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help, because of their slavery, went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So there's a lot of foreshadowing that's happening in this passage. And in the first two chapters of Exodus, really, it's going to tell us it's kind of like these little glimpses of what's to come. Moses confronts an Egyptian who's hurting a Hebrew slave, just as later Moses is going to confront a head Egyptian, Pharaoh, on behalf of all of the Hebrew slaves. It's kind of like those formative moments. You also get Moses' experience with grumbling. He tries to step in and do the right thing and be a leader in the dispute between the two Hebrews, and instead, he just gets brief. Oh, what are you going to do? Are you going to do what you did with that other guy? He's like, hey, trying to do the right thing here. He doesn't get rewarded for it. That can be frustrating. And you'll notice in this passage we just heard there were three rescues. It kind of happens all quickly. One, Moses rescues a Hebrew from an Egyptian kills him, hides him in the sand. Yikes. Then he sees two Hebrews fighting and rescues one from the other. And then now he's in Midian, and there's this, these daughters who are trying to get water from a well, and they're shooed away by some shepherds. And Moses says, no, 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 no. Hey, let them get their water. Three rescues. Kind of telling, telling us the story of Moses ahead of time. He's going to be this rescuer, this person who cares about doing the right thing, who's willing to take a risk of doing the right thing, who cares about justice. Sometimes people will point out, as they think of these parts of Exodus, Moses' origin story is kind of a lot like this ancient Babylonian king named Sargon from a thousand years earlier. He was put in a basket, and he was rescued, he was saved from someone who was trying to kill him as a baby. And maybe those similarities were emphasized on purpose. Maybe it was an intentional move to the people who told the story about a great leader. This is what God does in the lives of these great leaders, even from a young age. This is the story of a leader and how it's told. And this can all be very interesting stuff. We can go, wow, that's great. Now we know a little bit more about this 
But I think what's even more significant to us is not pointing backwards in history and comparing Moses to other leaders, but for us as Christians to point forward in Moses' timeline and compare him to Jesus. There are a lot of similarities here, and I'm not the first person to point these out. A lot of New Testament authors will say that, ah, the leadership of Jesus is a lot like the leadership of Moses. Jesus is the complete Moses. He is the new Moses. Moses was rescued from evil as a baby, the evil ruler, and he then became a rescuer. Jesus, too, was rescued from an evil ruler as a baby, Herod, and he becomes a rescuer. And like the river for Moses, the cross for Jesus, which was intended to be an instrument of death for him, ended up being that which brought salvation for those who believe in him. Again, remember, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. It's all kind of coming into focus now. We, as followers of Jesus, are beneficiaries of that salvation. Sin and death, like Pharaoh and Herod, are the evil despots in our lives determined to thwart God's desire for life and for flourishing. And they want to destroy us. But because our cries go up to the God who sees us, who knows us, who hears our cries, and because that God is faithful, we are saved through the cross of Jesus. Hallelujah. We celebrate that. And woven throughout all of this story, this is the story of Moses, the time of Jesus, the salvation we have in Jesus, and our own story that we know better than any of these other stories is this theme that God hears our cries. God cares about us. God is always at work through the ups and downs of life, through the ups and downs of faith. God is at work. And we've seen in these snapshots that God works in the lives of the people who are in power. He works in the lives of people who have no power. He works all the time through all different kinds of people, those who are near to him, those who are far from him, those who don't know his name, and even in people like us. It's an encouragement for us today. How can we let God use us for his purposes? God who's always at work, who's always faithful. More than just a trip down memory lane, for us, this is a testament of God's faithfulness throughout the years, throughout the generations, throughout the different specifics of the cries of God's people, the different needs that they have. God is always there. God hears. God loves. God is faithful. You ever go to like a beach town, kind of like Cannon Beach, Oregon? Sometimes they'll have a history of the shoreline in photographs. Like if you go to a pizza place or something, it'll be like, hey, this is what it looked like in the 50s. This is what the shoreline looked like in the 70s. This is what it looks like today. That's great. Those are awesome timelines. Here's photos of Haystack Rock from back in the day. These photos are, are great to look at because the things in front of the monument, the things in front of the shoreline, they change. The people's, the cars will change. The styles will change in people's clothing, their hairstyles. The names and the faces will change, but throughout the years, the monument stays the same. The rock is always in the same place throughout generations. And this is what our God is like. This is what Exodus wants us to see. God is there. God is at work. God is faithful. The Apostle Paul agrees that God often chooses to work through unassuming people. Their good deeds and their faithful choices. I always get a little uncomfortable when I hear this passage that we heard Sarah read a little bit earlier. Not many of you were wise when you were called. Not many of you were of great importance. It's like, wow, that's kind of mean. <laughs> Nobody was smart. Nobody did anything worth mentioning, and God still used you. Paul's making a very important point. And when we think about it, we, we get a little bit offended. Hey, I'm not that bad. Paul's like, well, I'm more talking about me than I'm talking about you. But the point is, sometimes we think God only works through the, the heroes the leaders, those in power, those with influence. But these stories remind us God works in those who are willing to let 
God work through them. And that's us. That's my encouragement for you this morning. So there's two invitations. One, let somebody know that you see Christ in them. Open that door for a conversation about, man, I follow this God who's loving and faithful. Some of that faithfulness in you. Talk about that. Get good at sharing that with people in your life. And the second invitation is just a simple invitation to come to know that Jesus, who was saved when he was a baby, and became the rescuer. He went to the cross and he provided salvation for all people. That invitation is there. And a lot of us, like John, was remembering the road that led him there, to be baptized, to say, not, here's all your sins in front of everybody, <laughs> it's confession time, but it's confessing Jesus. Not the bad in our life, but the good that he is. Jesus is the Son of God, and I want to follow him. When did you, 1953? Man, it's a long road. It's a lot of faithfulness. If you've never made that confession, if you've never said, yeah, I want to be bound forever to that Jesus, then I encourage you, make that confession. You're invited to do that. Uh, receive Christ in the waters of baptism. Um, yeah, Come and talk to me if you want to know more about that. But the door is open to follow Jesus. I pray that this word can take root in our hearts and make us better disciples of Jesus the Lord. Let me close this with prayer, and then Matt's going to come up and lead some specific prayers on behalf of people in the congregation. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for these stories that were preserved Stories that meant so much to Israel and that mean so much to us because they're pointing at something that we believe is true, and that is that you are faithful. We're thankful that you are faithful when we are not faithful. We praise you and we worship you in the ups of life, but sometimes in the downs of life we walk away, we lose hope, we lose faith, we get discouraged, and we're just so thankful that you don't give up on us, that you are constant, that you are strong and that you are faithful. And we're a room full of people at many different places in our faith this morning. Some people are up, some people are down. Some people feel close to you, some people feel farther. But God, thank you for this reminder that you are here, that you know us, and that you love us. We invite you to work in our lives. Work through us, work in spite of us. Let the names of these people who came to mind earlier, give us an encounter with them. Give us a meaningful conversation. Let us be an encourager for them. Let us help them take one step closer to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And along with the apostles, we cry out, increase our faith every day, Lord. Give us more faith. Give us more trust in you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm going to work off the emails that we've uh, had throughout the week. Um, we have a update from Wade and Sylvia Skinner. Uh, the email reads, good morning. We'd like to thank all of you and praise God that Sylvia's full treatment plan will be resuming this next Thursday, the 23rd. Her next surveillance scans are on the 28th, and we are praying that the delays have not impacted the good results we have seen so far. Sylvia's mother, Karen, is still struggling with her kidney disease, but the treatment plan has stabilized her, and she has been able to remain off of dialysis for the time being. Uh, they are also uh, traveling to Phoenix to deal with some uh, property issues and are asking for safe travels. Uh, we want to give praise. Uh, Al Hedden is out of the hospital. He is now in a uh, care facility where they um, can have more of a 24-hour watch on him. So I'm uh, sure Jan is uh, happy about that. And uh, we want to give praise to God that He's somewhere where they uh, have the ability to give him the attention he needs. Uh, we also have a uh, update uh, from 
Lazasa, uh, on her grandson, Bo, AJ. He's been admitted to Children's Hospital in Columbia. Uh, he had an episode um, in front of uh, the pediatrician, and that was sad that he did, but fortunate because the doctors were able to see exactly what was happening and were able to uh, work with uh, beginning the diagnosis. Bo's mom is able to stay with him. Uh, both are in good spirits, and um, we want to pray for healing and for uh, peace and that uh, the doctors will be able to uh, get to the bottom of what is going wrong. Uh, we also have our uh, prayer update from the beginning of the week. Um, Rosemary Hunt is uh, home. Her son is uh, staying with her for the meantime and uh, giving care there. Uh, she's not requesting any visitors, uh, last I heard. Um, so we want to keep her in the prayers. Um, Marla Hunkin is asked for prayers for uh, her brother Larry, uh, that he has the right relationship with God and he is. Uh, currently uh, fighting COVID and is in a hospice situation. And we also want to keep Dodie in our prayers. Uh, that she's going to the doctor and that the doctors are with her and uh, figure out things that um, are making her sick. Would you please go in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the day that we have. We want to thank you for the freedom we have to be able to assemble together, to worship you, to study about you, to share what we have learned and to share with those that are in our lives our love for you and how you give us the blessings and uh, that we can find spiritual peace through you. We know that uh, we are still part of this world. We still face many illnesses and sicknesses. We want you to be with the doctors as they work through the diagnosis so that uh, we can have our friends and families, our brothers and sisters in Christ healed and able to join us in this assembly. Also, that they can go out into the world and evangelize and show the world your great, your greatness in being healed through their faith in you. We also want you to be with other members of the congregation who may not have necessarily shared uh, their struggles. Uh, those struggles can come in a great many ways, but be with them, help them find ways to overcome, to uh, Find someone they can share those struggles with in the church that can give them encouragement and to pray with them and give them a blessing to go forward to get beyond those struggles. We want you to be with our world leaders. Our world seems to be in a lot of chaos right now. We need you to put them in positions so that they can make the right choices and guide them in a way that uh, will benefit not just us, but the world as a whole. This is uh, why you sent your son uh, to us to live with us and to die so that we can have our sins forgiven and go to heaven. These people around the world need to hear that. Be with our missionaries as they go out and share in communities where they may not necessarily be welcome. Keep them safe, keep them sound, and help them as well as us to remind the world that you are uh, their creator and that you love us all and you need us uh, to get more spiritually in tune with uh, the things that you want us to be doing. In Jesus' name, amen.